Hey everybody, Pastor Wayne here with you again from Alpine Bible Church. I want to spend our time together today, today talking about how the heavens reveal God's glory. I'm going to start by asking you a question today. Uh, when was the last time that you got to lay on your back at night and just stare up into the night sky? Uh, I hope if you did, the last time you did, I hope it was away from the city, somewhere out in the wild, so that you could see all of the splendor of God's creation. Uh, you could clearly see, obviously, the moon and the stars and the planets and the constellations if you're able to identify them. But um, I maybe you even saw a shooting star or a comet. Um, you know, I used to like to watch the space shuttle when it was orbiting the Earth. I used to like to watch the space shuttle as it moved across the sky. There was just something unique about knowing that there were men in that vehicle and women just orbiting around our Earth like that. It's just quite incredible to me. Everything, uh, there's, there's so much wonder in the heavens to see, and yet... There's, so, there's hundreds of solar systems, there's billions or millions and billions of stars that we don't see. The little bit that we can see is incredible enough, but it, it's amazing to think about all we really can't see. And, uh, and, and David tells us in Psalm 19 that it's all God's handiwork, and it's all created it to reveal His glory. And I think that's so unique to us and, and something that can help us to, to, to really start to understand the glory of God. So let's look at Psalm 19. I'm just going to look at verses 1 through 3. They say that the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Now, it's so interesting that David starts this psalm out saying that the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Uh, the best way to understand what he's talking about when he says heavens is to think of everything God created except the earth and the things that are on it. And that makes up the heavens. And so everything that we see, and as we pointed out, so much that we can't see, everything that we see encompasses the heavens. And David said that these heavens are telling of the glory of God. Um, I like the fact that that's present tense. David doesn't say that they used to just tell of the glory of God, or sometime in the future they're going to tell of it. That's all true. But we know that they're telling right now of the glory of God. And... All you got to do is walk outside and look up. And maybe it's a beautiful day like today where the sun is shining and maybe there's a few puffy clouds around. Maybe it's cloudy and rainy. Or, or maybe it's at night again and you're seeing millions of stars and you're seeing a bright moon. Whatever you're able to see when you go out there is telling right now the glory of God. That means that the heavens are an ongoing message of God's glory. I hope you get that. I hope you understand that. Let me say it again. The heavens are an ongoing message of God's glory. Every time you look up, you see God's glory. And just to reiterate it, David says in the next phrase, the expanse of the heavens is declaring the work of his hands. Again, is declaring its present tense. The heavens aren't only telling of the glory of God, but they're also showing forth his handiwork, the work of his hands. Um, the expanse of the heavens is just another way of saying the heavens. And so David is reminding us again that, that whatever we can see as we look into the heavens, whatever we can see, and, and, and again, still all of the stuff we can't see, are the personal handiwork of our God, all created so that we can begin to understand His glory, all created so that His glory is revealed, but it, in a way that we can start to understand it and we can start to get it. And then David explains, okay, how can we see God's glory in the handiwork of the heavens? How, how is that visible to us? And he says that in the next phrase. He says, day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. And so the whole idea behind that is that the, the day sky, when you look up into it, and the night sky, when you look up to him, they speak of God. They reveal wonderful knowledge about him and about his creation. You remember in Genesis chapter 1, uh, we'll read verses 3 through 5. It says that then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day and he called the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. 
And so just the very fact that each day comes and goes just like the last day and that each night comes and goes just the way God originally created them to function, just those facts alone, David is saying, speak truths and knowledge about God that we all can see. Because day turns into night, turns into day, turns into night. That whole cycle, that whole function is revealing knowledge about God. And it's revealing his glory because he set it up. He created it all that way. Now, David doesn't say they speak out loud. He doesn't say that they speak knowledge about God, but they don't speak out loud. He says this at the, in verse 3. He says, there is no speech, and nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. So that there's not a verbal speaking of the knowledge of God's glory, but still the heavens are still speaking because they're there for all of us to see. And the fact that they function the way that they do. Doesn't matter where you live on this earth. It doesn't matter what language you speak. None of those things matter. When you look up into the heavens, they are speaking of the knowledge of God and they're showing his glory through his handiwork of creation. And uh, Paul, Paul tells us this and reiterates it to us in uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Listen, this is so good for us. God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature are, have all been clearly seen and since the beginning of creation. Nobody can say God doesn't exist because the heavens, creation, are clearly revealing him to all. They, just the fact, again, the fact that they're there, uh, it's because of his, his invisible uh, attributes and his eternal power and his divine nature. All of those things are what caused him to create it and caused him to put it there. But just the fact that they're there means that our God exists. So no one can ever say God doesn't exist. Isaiah adds to these truths about how the heavens reveal God's greatness in, in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26. He says this, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. What an incredible statement. Isaiah is so confident in the fact that the heavens reveal the glory of God. He says not one of the stars and, and by the way, not one of the stars whom God has numbered and calls by name, not one of them is missing. Isaiah has that much faith and belief in the greatness of God's might and the strength of his power. That he has created all of those stars and he has created it all and none of them is missing. Nothing is missing. That's a pretty incredible faith for Isaiah to be able to state when he knew so much less than we know today about all those stars and so much less than we know today about the heavens. And yet he makes that wonderful statement. In Psalm 8, David is again uh, considering this incredible truth about God's creation. And, and he can't help but wonder, what, why would a God that's so powerful and that's that glorious, uh, why would he even consider man, let alone Take care of us and care for us as much as he does. Listen to Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. He says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You know, it's hard to disagree with David. It's hard to, to you know, it truly is a wonder that the God who spoke everything into existence would pay any attention to the likes of us. And yet, we know that he takes thought of us. We know that he cares for us so much. And we know that he loves us with an everlasting love. We know all of those things. So it's a wonder. We wonder like David did. But yet we have confidence in, in understanding the truths that we know about him as mu how much he really does love us. You know, I think that's why creation is so comforting to us. We talk about wanting to go out into the mountains and wanting to, to be able to look up in the sky and see things. And, and creation is so comforting to us because in his great love, God gave it to us so that we could see his glory as it's revealed in many wonderful truths about him. It's a, creation is just comforting to us. 
And, and Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 kind of explain how, how all this creation come about and what it was for. It says, for by him, talking about Jesus, all things were created, <laughs> both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There's some amazing truths in those couple of verses, but just think about this. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus, it says, because he was before all things. He was there. Remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was there right from the beginning. He is the creator, and, and all things have been created through him and for him. And, and what's unique to me, again, this is talking in the present tense. He keeps all things together. He upholds it all and keeps it all functioning by his power. And again, it's also that when we look into the heavens and we see creation, we see his glory and his power. The writer of Hebrews tells us the same thing in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, and he, again, talking about Jesus, he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus upholds all things just by the word of his power. That's pretty incredible. Now, think with me for just a few minutes, if you will, what it really means that Jesus upholds all things. Um, I have a few facts about our earth and, uh, and about the way it functions and stuff that it's just incredible to think about that Jesus keeps all of this order in place. Uh, the first thing relates to the distance that the earth is from the sun. Our earth is approximately 93 million miles away from the sun. Obviously, when it orbits, some of that, uh, some of that changes, but but it's about 93 million miles away from the sun. And, and it's the perfect distance to keep life functioning. If we were any closer, we'd be too close and we'd burn up. And if we were any further away, we'd be so far away, we'd freeze. Just like the temperature on the other planets, the planets that are between us and the sun are much hotter than the temperature of Earth. The planets that are, that are further away from the sun than us are much cooler. The temperatures of those planets are much cooler. So God has set it up so that we are at the perfect place to sustain life on the Earth. And the second thing that's unique is that the Earth rotates at about 1,000 miles an hour. That seems pretty incredible that as we're sitting here right now, this earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. But that's what sustains our length of days and length of nights. Even if it changed by a little bit, it would cause our days to be so long that it, and it would get so hot that vegetation couldn't even survive. It would burn up. And the same with the nights, or the nights would get so cold that if it slowed down, the nights would get so cold that it would freeze. I mean, all of these things are in perfect order and perfectly in place. Think about the Earth's atmosphere for a minute. The, Earth, the Earth's atmosphere is made up of 78 parts of nitrogen, 21 parts of oxygen, and then one part of various other things. But listen, if, if there were more nitrogen than 78 parts, then our bodies would slow down to the point that they, wouldn't that they couldn't function properly and we'd eventually die. Our, our organs and things within our body would just start shutting down. And the same if, if, if there was any more oxygen. If there was any more oxygen, everything in our body would speed up. And speed up so fast that it couldn't sustain itself. It couldn't keep going. And, and again, we would die. So even, even the makeup of our atmosphere is, is perfect for us. Uh, the last thing that's unique to me is, is the tilt of the earth. This one has always amazed me. The tilt of the earth is 23.5 degrees. Now... That's how we get our seasons, obviously, is the way the earth is tilted. And as it rotates and then as we, we do our uh, orbit around the sun, as all of that stuff takes place, that's how we get our seasons. But if it was tilted any more or less, it would change the length of our seasons. And it, would make, it could make summer like all year and be really hot all year. Or it could make winter cold all year. And, and so it would cause all of these odd things to happen with our seasons and even with our days and nights again. Too much heat, too much uh, cold uh, for the length of the days and nights. And, and so all of these things work out in perfect order. Uh, everything in God's heaven is created to very specific standards, and it functions in very specific ways. And it's so unique to me to realize that it's all held together by the word of the power of our Lord. That's pretty crazy. 
One more verse to look at in Jeremiah chapter 31 of 35 and 36. It's uh, the verses 35 and 36. God's explaining to Israel, this is a unique thing. God is explaining to Israel that he established this whole fixed order. And if it ever stops functioning, then Israel will no longer be a nation. Isn't that interesting? God, God says, you're my nation and, and you're, my, you're my chosen people forever. And he says, but if, if the heavens, the way they're set up, ever stop functioning, then you're no longer my people and you're no longer a nation. That's kind of an interesting thing. Listen to these verses. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that, it wa so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Now this is God talking. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease to be a nation before me forever. Now, praise the Lord that we know that God's going to keep this fixed order functioning. He's going to keep it in place. He's going to keep it functioning perfectly until he creates a new heaven and a new earth. And when he creates a new heaven and a new earth, then, then, then his chosen people, then Israel, the nation of Israel, they won't be a nation anymore. They'll just be part of God's people in heaven just like all of us. And so God promises that that system is going to stay in place and it's going to function the way he wants it to until he's ready to change it. All of these facts reveal the glory and the handiwork of God. And it's just, it's pretty amazing just to consider some of the, the few things that we've talked about that relate to his creation and what they reveal about him and his glory. There's so much more we could cover, but it's been enjoyable just to cover this much. And, and so here's what I'm thinking. Hopefully, the next time you get a chance to look up into the heavens, the next time you get to lay on your back and look up into the heavens, I, I just hope it causes you to thank God for his incredible creation uh, and for the glory that his handiwork reveals. What a wonderful thing we have to, to look at all the time. I know we also have our mountains and we have all of that around us that we can constantly look at and just say, our God is amazing. But on top of all that, I also pray that, that all of these truths about God and his creation and his existence and what they reveal about his glory and his handiwork, what the heavens reveal about that, I pray that it causes all humans, maybe you're listening to this and you haven't ever placed your faith and belief in Jesus, and, and I pray that, that it'll cause you to understand more about who this creator is. And, and cause you to want to learn more and, and try to understand more about who he is and ultimately desire to place your faith and belief in him, the one who sustains it all. And put, place your faith and belief in Jesus Christ. So that's, that's what I pray, pray today. And, and I, 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 just, I just encourage you to, to look up into the sky, look and see the handiwork of your Lord, because it's amazing. Yeah. Let's go ahead and pray real quick, and then I'll close this. Lord, thank you so much that, uh, that, that we can, all we have to do is look up, and we see your handiwork, and we see your glory. Thank you that, that anyone can see you. There's, there's no one that can say God doesn't exist. When you look at the heavens, and you look at how the intricacies of how they operate and how they function, and the fact that, that it's a fixed order that you've put together, and, and it's not going to change until you're ready to change it. And, and so we thank you for that, and we thank you for the glory it reveals and the truths that it reveals. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God and that you're so great, and we pray in Jesus' name. Hey, thanks again for joining us, and uh, and this is actually going to be our last midweek devotion as we're getting ready to start into some of our summer schedule of classes and, and to get into doing things a little differently uh, at church. So I just want to say thanks for listening in all these weeks, and, uh, and Lord willing, we'll get to all talk to each other again soon. And Thank you so much.